Good evening. My name is David Hall. I am the president of the University of the Virgin Islands. And on behalf of our faculty, students, trustees, and alum, I want to welcome you to the first, the inaugural lecture series of the Andre and Edith Rose Galabair Medical Lecture Series. The university is extremely honored to be able to launch and host this important lecture series. I want to thank the family members, the Galibert family, for preserving in this very, very special way the legacy of Andre and Edith Rose Galibert, two outstanding and dedicated health professionals who served this community with their skills, with their insights, and with their hearts. This lecture series is consistent with one of the highest priorities of the University of the Virgin Islands. For a number of years now, we have been committed to creating a medical school at the University of the Virgin Islands so that we can better serve this community so that we can work to improve the quality of health care, attract more physicians, train students who want to pursue medical careers, and to transform our community. And this lecture series is very consistent with that goal. And as president, I look forward to us hosting these lectures in the future in our medical school facilities. This lecture tonight is very much consistent with one of the major challenges that the Virgin Islands, this nation, and this world are facing. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed our lives. It has taken lives away from us, and it has created all sorts of other types of ramifications for us as human beings, for families, for the community. And it is extremely important that we understand this pandemic, that we understand its consequences, and that we understand how we can keep each other safe and combat this challenge. And therefore, to have distinguished individuals who have expertise and insights to share, not only with those who are gathered here, <clears throat> but those worldwide who are able to listen, is a blessing and a major contribution. <clears throat> it is what universities must do, explore and understand the known, and to push to understand the unknown and in the process, make life better. So it is indeed an honor for us to launch this series. It is indeed an honor for us to have the family present. And at this point in time, uh, I would ask that uh, Dante Galabair, on behalf of the Galabair family, please come forward. Thank you, UVI President David Hall, and good evening to the distinguished guests, medical and nursing personnel, friends and family. I am Dr. Dante P. Galibert, your co-host for this evening. I would like to thank the University of the Virgin Islands in working with the ad hoc committee
for the establishment of the Andre and Edith Galibert Medical Lecture Series. This will be the first of many annual lectures. Dr. Andre A. Galibert Sr. was the Director of Radiology Departments at the Charles Harwood Hospital and the Governor Wanafuli Hospital for 21 years. He was a distinguished fellow of the American College of Radiology. Mrs. Edith Rose Lewis Galibert was a registered nurse and was Director of Public Health Nursing for 15 years. They were champions of healthcare delivery in the Virgin Islands. They were committed to medical education and scholarship and were the proud parents of six children, four of whom pursued careers in healthcare. In late summer of 2020, it was imperative that the committee postponed the original date of the conference to the new year and changed the topic to the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19, which is caused by coronavirus, has affected persons from all walks of life and from all corners of the globe. Since antiquity, mankind has effectively battled pandemics through preparedness and with scientific discovery. As Virgin Islanders, we have not escaped COVID-19's wide path of morbidity and mortality. Collectively, our community has risen to the challenge of this pandemic and has understood the science behind prevention, treatment, and vaccination. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Noreen Michael. She has a doctorate in educational psychology and is the interim director of the Caribbean Exploratory Research Center. She is the moderator for this evening's Andre and Edith Galibert Medical Lecture. Please welcome Dr. Michael. Thank you, Dr. Galibert. Good evening, President Hall, Dr. Dante Galibert, and other members of the Galibert family present. Distinguished panelists, Vice President Neves, and other members of institutional advancement, and all others here at the Great Hall and those in the virtual space. It is a distinct honor and privilege for me to serve as moderator for this evening's panel discussion, which marks the inaugural convening of the Andre and Edith Galibert Medical Lecture Series. We are pleased that you have joined us for this special event and want to remind you that there will be a 15-minute question and answer session after all three panelists have presented. So do have your questions ready and we will get to as many of them as time allows. For physicians in attendance, CME Category 2 credits can be obtained. Similarly, for nurses in attendance, CEU credits can be obtained. And now, I'm delighted to introduce uh, the three panel members. I will do so in the order in which they will speak. First, we have Dr. Esther Ellis. Dr. Esther Ellis received her PhD in tropical medicine from the University of Hawaii's John A. Burns School of Medicine in 2011. She completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Duke National University of Singapore in the Emerging Infectious Disease Department and went on to complete a two-year Epidemic Intelligence Service Fellowship with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention focusing on the epidemiology of dengue virus. Dr. Ellis has been the Territorial Epidemiologist for the United States Virgin Islands Department of Health since 2014. In that role, she has led the Department of Health's efforts in response to chikungunya, Zika, and now COVID-19 outbreaks. Second, we have joining us virtually Dr. Ty Hunt Caesar, Dr. Ty Camille Hunt Caesar, originally from St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands, attended public schools and graduated from high school in 1997. She subsequently obtained a BS degree in, and a medical degree at Howard University in Washington, D.C. 
Thereafter, she completed an internal medicine residency program and a fellowship in infectious disease at Jackson Memorial Hospital at the University of Miami's Miller School of Medicine. During her residency, she joined the J. Weiss Residency for Global Health Equity. As a J. Weiss resident, she obtained a Master's of Science degree in Public Health and completed international electives in the Caribbean, South America, and South Africa. Dr. Hunt sees a return to St. Thomas in 2011, where she has been in public and private uh, practice. She is currently employed at the Virgin Islands Department of Health and serves as Chief Medical Officer, Territorial Infectious Diseases Physician, and a provider of HIV primary and specialty care. She also provides inpatient infectious diseases consults and serves as the chairwoman of the Infection Control Department at the Schneider Regional Medical Center where she previously served as Chief of Medicine from January 2015 to May 2017. She's a staff member of the AIDS Education Training, Training Center, providing HIV AIDS education to community providers in the Virgin Islands. She's certified with the American Board of Internal Medicine for internal medicine and infectious diseases. She's married to a local pharmacy owner, and together they have one daughter. And finally, we have Dr. Dara Hamilton. Dr. Dara Hamilton is an assistant professor of psychology at the University of the Virgin Islands. She's also a licensed clinical psychologist who owns and operates the Lotus Center for Wellbeing, a private practice on the island of St. Croix. Dr. Hamilton is at heart a community psychologist who believes in seeking health solutions in the forms of individual and systems change and advocating for social justice. And now without further ado, please join me in welcoming our panelists, beginning with Dr. Esther Ellis. Thank you, thank you for that introduction. Um, and uh, I did wanna thank uh, the organizers of the Andre and Edith Rose Scalibur Medical Lecture Series for putting on this event and um, specifically thank you to Dr. Dante Galliver for the invitation to speak here tonight. Um, next slide. I'm gonna talk specifically about the epidemiology of COVID-19 in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Next. Um, and give a little bit of history of what we've seen um, over the past year, really 2020, where we started and where we are now. Um, but the, the timeline for COVID-19 really um, escalated pretty rapidly. In, in January, January 30th of 2019, the WHO declared a, an international emergency declaration. Uh, shortly after the USA national emergency declared was declared by HHS, that was um, a day after 131, 2019. Um, we had our first case of COVID-19 confirmed in March of um, March 13th of 2020, and Governor Bryan declared a state of emergency that same day on March 13th, 2020. Uh, and then shortly after that, former President Trump approved the USVI emergency declaration. And, and really, as this started, you know, we really started watching what was happening internationally in late December, early January. And um, the cases vary considerably by country, state, territory, and city. And it's really dependent on time of introduction. And so we were doing surveillance in the Virgin Islands really starting in January looking for cases, but we were able to detect our first case in March, March 13th. And so that was probably close to around when it got introduced. It's possible there was an earlier introduction that we didn't pick up through surveillance efforts. Um, and also it's dependent on community spread. 
and, and that's dependent on the local environment. So that really has to do with population density and social practices. And even within the territory, um, those differ widely. We know that St. Thomas is a much more dense population than St. Croix and St. John, and social practices differ within the territory as well. It's also dependent on mitigation measures, such as shelter at home, or safer at home, or you know, closures that, that were enforced, and um, travel. And it's also biased uh, according to testing practices, availability, and reporting. And one thing that we were really lucky um, here uh, with testing is we've never had a shortage of testing. Uh, and we've done really well compared to other states and, and territories. We are still the only place where you can, anybody can get a test within 24 hours, which is really incredible. Uh, next. Uh, this is a map uh, as of January 26 from the WHO Coronavirus Disease Dashboard, and it looks at um, worldwide how many cases have occurred. The darker the color blue, the more cases have occurred in that particular region. And as of the 26th, there have been over 98 million cases of COVID-19 uh, within the world and over 2 million uh, deaths. Next slide. And then zooming in, specifically to the U.S., uh, there have been over 25 million total cases and 417, 936 deaths, and that's as of Tuesday. And you can see here the darker the color on the state, the more cases in that particular state. Next. And this was looking at some of the data back in, in April where um, different uh, statisticians were predicting how many cases there would be active versus recovered versus fatalities. And the image on the left shows the global rise of coronavirus cases, the development of worldwide active cases, recovered and deceased. And as you see, that caps out in April at just over 1 million cases. And here we are um, almost a year, nine, 10 months after that, and we're at 19 million cases. So it is continuing to rise, even um, with the vaccine availability. And then the other sh curve shows the upward trajectory versus the flattened curve. And what we really wanted to do was um, that the blue curve that's spiking up is the U.S. We really wanted to, in the U.S. Virgin Islands, flatten our curve. And what that does is it allows healthcare systems to time to respond and the capacity to respond because it's a lower number of cases over a longer period of time. Uh, next slide. And there was a lot of uncertainty, too, because this is a new virus, and so there's a lot of things that were either unknown or continued to um, be learned, and more and more data to support you know, certain hypotheses that, were, um, that either were proved to be true or, or the data would show that it was slightly different than what was initially uh, predicted. And so some of these are, are headlines. Multiple experts say up to 70% of Americans could be infected with coronavirus and one million could die if no treatment found. So luckily we've, um, in the U.S., we, it's been 400, just over 416,000 deaths. So I'm, I'm really glad that that prediction did not come true. But another headline, coronavirus could infect 60% of the global population if unchecked. Uh, another one, coronavirus will infect half the population that EIU predicts. And the last one, because there's no population immunity, we are going to see a lot of infections in the United States, maybe you know, over 40% of the population because may become infected with the virus. And that was Dr. Amesh uh, Ad Adalia, Adalja, sorry, an infectious disease expert connected to Johns Hopkins University. Next. There was a less, also a lot of uncertainty over uh, asymptomatic versus symptomatic. And what was really, what was not known in the very beginning, if, if people that are not sick or asymptomatic could spread the disease or not. And unfortunately, um, around March, April, we did learn that asymptomatic transmission does occur, can occur, and is a huge um, driver of, of the outbreak because there are individuals that don't get sick at all but still transmit it to others. And that's really hard to control from an epidemiological standpoint. Um, but how many percent, what percent of people are asymptomatic was unknown. So some of the predictions early on were 25 to 50 percent, 30 percent. Um, it's estimated one in four could be asymptomatic. Next slide. 
And, and one of the things that we did know is that elderly are at more risk of severe disease. And so the, the, um, the graph on the left that's a darker red um, bar graph shows that if you're 80 years or older, the chance of fatality if you do get COVID-19 is 14.8%. And that goes down as your age decreases. Also, millions in the US were at severe risk because of comorbidities, pre-existing health conditions. And that sh uh, shows that 79% of Americans that are 80 years or older have pre-existing health conditions that would contribute to more severe disease. Next. So the risk for the USVI and what can be done to limit the number is, is what we were really um, attempting to get at. And that number of people could vary, infected could vary greatly, again, dependent on social practices. So we put into place particular limitations such as social distancing, shelter at home. Um, education was really important to talk about what, what does social distancing really mean? What is sheltering at home? It was also dependent upon epidemiological activities such as contact tracing. And contact tracing is really quite complex. Um, and the more accurate and the more quickly epidemiologists can conduct the contact tracing, the better we can control the disease spread. Also, the mortality rate was dependent upon flattening the curve. If we could uh, ensure that there was enough space in both hospitals to, to house every COVID patient that needed hospitalization, that there was enough ventilators, enough oxygen, um, all of the supplies, um, the PPE, which is the, the personal protective equipment that you need to wear um, in order to take care of a COVID patient was very important. Um, and that's, it was very important to keep that curve flat so that we had enough of those supplies. Uh, and so what were we expecting? We expected to detect around 3,000 to 5,000 cases. Um, we did run a model within the epidemiology division to estimate how many hospitalizations and potentially how many deaths there would be um, based on certain practices. We also prepared the hospitals to be able to accommodate the surge and we educated the community on necessary practices and enforced those when necessary. We also conducted testing and contact tracing. Next. So this is the model, the original model that we ran to predict how many hospitalizations there would be. The red curve is if um, there's no inter intervention that's over, um, it's hard to see, but I think it's about over 2,000 hospitalizations if there was no intervention. The yellow curve is if there was um, social distancing, and that's just under 1,000 hospitalizations at the peak of that curve. And the green curve is um, if we sheltered in place, and that's the highest number of hospitalizations and that's territory-wide is 117. Um, so I'm really happy to say that we, as the U.S. Virgin Islands, as a community, um, did even better than the green curve, and we um, never had more than 25 hospitalizations within the territory, um, even at the peak of our hospitalizations. Uh, so, so I know that a lot of that is, is because our community abided by mask wearing, um, did actually shelter at home, and really heeded the guidance. And, and some of that is also um, because of how many introductions we may have had within the community, um, population density, and environmental factors as well. Next slide. So this is the epidemiology report. It's a, a piece of it. And the next couple of slides, we'll go through the whole epi report. We release these every day. Um, if you haven't seen them and you're looking at it and you would like to get them daily, you can get them on the DOH Facebook page or on the website, covid19usvi.gov. Uh, and so at the top is the testing summary. So far, we've tested over 40,000 individuals within the territory. And that's almost half of our population, which is really an incredible testing effort. The total that have tested positive uh, is just over 2,000. And then underneath that is the total tested negative and the total pending tests. And the change, the far right um, column is the change since the day before. So this is Monday's report. 
that was released on January 25th. And directly under that is um, the, the results tested and the test result by age. And so you'll see that um, 40 to, well, 30 to 50 year olds are more likely to get tested, um, but they're not necessarily more likely to be positive. Um, the percent positivity next to that is pretty consistent among all age groups being slightly higher in the 18 to 29 age group. And then the, the graph underneath that shows the positive test result um, by age group over time. And then just to the side of that are um, test results among males and females. So that really shows that females are more likely to get tested. Um, they're in, the gray, in gray and males are in blue. And um, as far as more likely to be positive, males are slightly more likely to be positive. And that's really an indicative of healthcare seeking behavior. Um, women are more likely to get tested with or without symptoms. Um, maybe it's a small concern and men are more likely to get tested if they're actually sick and so they're more likely to be positive. Um, and then on the right, uh, you'll see current, um, some of the numbers broken down too. So current status of USVI positive cases, there's uh, 72 active cases as of Monday. Uh, the majority of our cases have recovered and there have been 24 fatalities. And so that active case number is really important because every single one of those um, active, 72 active cases is currently quarantined in either in their home or in a non-congregate living facility. And the Department of Health is also responsible for providing um, supportive services to those individuals. And then each one of those has at least an average of five to 10 contacts um, that they came into contact with while they were positive. And we also follow every single one of those contacts and monitor them daily um, through, it depends, um, the individuals can decide how they want to be followed, so it can be text, phone, or um, email. And so um, if it's text, you'll get a text message to say, do you have a fever? Do you have a cough? You have to answer a series of questions. Um, and then, and then uh, depending on your result, we may follow up uh, in person or via phone with those individuals. And the USVI uh, risk factors for transmission, the highest risk factor has always been close contact. Uh, close contact is if you've been within six feet of an individual that tests positive for 15 minutes without a mask on. And that's 15 cumulative minutes during a day. So if you had contact with someone who is positive, you're within six feet for five minutes, three times through the day, you would be considered a close contact. Uh, followed by community transmission. And community transmission is really when we, we don't know um, where that person got it from. They could have um, got it from work, they could have got it from um, a, a close contact grocery store, anywhere. Um, it wasn't someone within their household or a known close contact. Um, followed by travel and then uh, followed by under investigation, which means we're still investigating um, the mode of transmission for that case. And then the last um, graph on this page is clinical symptoms of positive. Uh, and so we talked about the uncertainty of how many people are asymptomatic. Well, in the Virgin Islands, 22% of our positive cases are asymptomatic. Um, over 30% have a cough, over 30% have a fever, and um, a smaller percentage have shortness of breath. Next slide. Uh, and this is the... Uh, on the second page of the report, the first graph, this is the rate of positive tests in the U.S. Virgin Islands over time. And that red line is really important for decision-making purposes. And what that red line is, is the seven-day percent positivity. And um, as of Monday, we were at 3%. It's really important for us to try to keep that number under 5%. And the reason for that is if it's under 5%, it means we're doing enough testing, because it means only 5% or less of everyone we're testing is actually positive. Um, and that you want your number to be low. If it's too high, if let's say 50% of everyone you're testing is positive, it means there's many, many more positives out there that you're not catching because you're not testing enough. Um, also, if it's under 5%, it means that the contact tracing is able to effectively control um, the virus, uh, the spread of the virus. Next slide. Uh, and this is a, uh, a graph of the confirmed cases uh, split up by islands. So you'll see that St. Croix is in blue, St. Thomas is in orange, um, and St. John 
is in green. So, so far, St. Thomas has had the majority of the cases. This is actually what we expected to see um, because the population density on St. Thomas is so much greater than on St. Croix. And we expected St. Croix to be a little bit of a flatter, slower curve. Um, next slide. Uh, and this is the cases broken down by estate. Um, purple is an estate that has over 60, uh, 75 cases. Sorry, it's a little small on my screen, but um, over 75 cases is one estate on St. Croix, three estates on St. Thomas, and no estates on St. John, but the magenta color is um, about 60 cases in that estate. And so we do keep track to see if a particular estate is being affected more than others, and if there's a reason for that, and, and would go into that area to see if, you know, are they having house parties? No, <laughs> no those are de definitely not, um, not encouraged. That's actually um, a big spreader, especially in the States right now during colder weather to not have indoor parties. But we will investigate to see what, what is happening in that estate that's contributing to the spread. Uh, and then it's just the broken down, a little bit more what I said earlier as far as active recovered fatalities and then how, the, how is the transmission occurring, uh, close contact, community, traveler under investigation, either for St. Croix, St. Thomas, and Water Island, or St. John. Next. And then this last slide, I'm not going to get into all the details of what happens when we do a contact trace, but just to give you a little idea of how much time it takes, it usually to do a contact trace on one person it takes anywhere from one to two hours, and it really depends on how many contacts that person had, because we do have to get into um, the details of each contact and how, what was the contact, how did it occur, and get all the contact information for those individuals so we can enroll them in monitoring as well. And contact tracing allows us to find cases quickly so that they can be isolated and reduce the spread. The next slide. And this is just another schematic of, of kind of what happens from an index case, one. That index case gives it to four people, shown in purple. One of those four people gives it to two people, shown in blue. One of those blue people gives it to two. And that's, that change just contributes. Sometimes, you know, one of those green people could give it to six people. It just really depends on what the behavior is of each of those individuals and so the more that each individual is really following the guidance that's out there wearing masks does work um, we've had a couple we do have schools that are open right now we've had a couple positive cases within the school and as a result have tested um, everybody within the school that had exposure and no one in any of the school positives so far there have been three various schools with positives has tested positive um, within the school which is a huge testament to masks do work um, there's 100% mask wearing within the schools that are open and social distancing practices and eating lunch six feet apart outside. Um, so the goal really is to break that chain um, to stop transmission or to slower transmission. And it's, it's a hard job and it really the asymptomatic transmission makes it an even harder job because you could be feeling perfectly fine but then give it, um, pass it to others. And sometimes those end up being um, super spreaders because they don't, they're not sick, so they're not really changing their behavior. Um, and so next slide. Uh, really, it's important. Everybody's role is important. Uh, and so how do we do in the USBI compared to other states and territories? Well, we are the only state and territory where anyone that needs a test can get a test the uh, same day. So if you got tested today, you would get your result today. Um, that's an incredible achievement. Um, and it's really a testament to the hard work of many individuals at the Department of Health that secured the federal funding to purchase um, what was needed that is on top of purchasing supplies and equipment needed to do the testing. We actually distribute all of the testing supplies to partner laboratories within the territory um, and, and uh, have each place has an allocation that they get every week. Um, that involves shipping test supplies over on the ferry or, you know, flying them over on the seaplane so that uh, everything that's needed is shared within the territory and moved as it's needed because sometimes maybe St. Thomas might be experiencing more cases one week and need to ramp up their testing or, or St. Croix or St. John. So it's really been a huge um, collaboration and we couldn't have 
done that without many, many partners. And so thank you to all of those on the COVID task force team and everybody within Department of Health. Um, we continue to also have the lowest COVID case rate in the US and territories. Uh, one of the reasons that does contribute to that is our warm weather. We can still do many activities outside. Uh, you can exercise outside, you can eat outside. Um, so being able to do things outside versus inside really does lower the, the case rate. Also over the span of the outbreak, we are the fourth lowest in cases per 100,000 persons. Um, in comparison, the highest is six times ours. And we also have the third lowest death rate. In comparison, the highest in the nation is 10 times what ours is. So the next slide is my last slide. Uh, and I did just wanna say that um, everybody's role is critical because what we choose to do affects not only us, not only our family, but everybody in our community that we pass by, walk by, come into contact with. And so just remember that as we move through this outbreak together, it's not over. Um, there are many tools that are gonna help us along the way, including vaccines. And Dr. Hunt, Ty Hunt Caesar is gonna talk about that a little bit next, but um, thank you very much. Good Dr. Evening, Hans everyone. Caesar, you can uh, proceed, and we are uh, behind time, so we need to uh, look at our time, please. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, as Dr. Esther Ellis said, I just want to personally. Is it possible also thank to Dr. increase your volume? For extending this invitation, for the presenters, UBI and um, especially Dr. Gallagher for continuing to provide service to the Department of Health as well. Um, so jumping right in, um, the first slide, if you can advance. To this evening, I will be talking about the pathology and the disease management of COVID-19. Thank you. So um, as Dr. Ellis mentioned um, earlier, she gave a very excellent um, presentation on the symptoms presentation and um, the percentage of what people within the territory actually present with. So COVID-19, um, people who are infected with the coronavirus can present with um, many different symptoms. As Dr. Ellis mentioned before, some cannot have any symptoms and then you can have uh, a range of symptoms. And cough being the most common complaint or symptom that people present with, followed by fever, um, headaches and body aches after that. And then you can also have um, shortness of breath or difficulties breathing. And then other sort of flu-like symptoms that you might have, sore throat. And then also you can have many different um, symptoms that may not be typical of the respiratory tract. You can also have diarrhea, um, nausea and vomiting, and then um, also you can have uh, what we consider or call anosmia, or loss of smell and loss of taste. This has been something that was unusual um, and um, we noticed very early on with the, with, with the, in, during the beginning of the pandemic. Can also present with abdominal pain but largely the most people will present with cough and fever as Dr. Ellis pointed out that is reported in the in the daily epi, epi reports that are, that is sent out next slide so the disease spectrum can be very broad it can range from no symptoms and um, as you can see it's, it's it's a wide range that the that it can be estimated it can be anywhere between 20 to 40 percent but as, as Dr. Ellis stated, these asymptomatic individuals remain contagious. Uh, but it, interestingly, even without symptoms, uh, up to half of the people might actually present with um, having abnormal studies, whether they're laboratory studies or radiographic studies. 80% uh, um, of people will have mild disease, and the symptoms presentation will just essentially be almost that of like a cold or flu-like symptoms. Uh, these, these people who have mild disease will not have any evidence of pneumonia. 
about 14% of individuals has been estimated to have severe disease. These are the individuals that who are infected, who have very difficulty breathing. They have um, what we consider hypoxia or um, limitation of, of oxygen levels in the body and extensive lung involvement. And I'll show you what that can be in the, in the future slides. And then about 5% of individuals will have um, critical disease in which they will advance to have um, system, multi-system multi shock, uh, respiratory failure, what we call acute respiratory distress syndrome, um, and also multi-organ dysfunction in which they can have um, many different systems failing um, in the intensive care unit in the hospital. Next slide. The risk factors, as Dr. Ellis also pointed out, are, um, can, can depict or determine the extent of the disease. And age is a factor. Um, as stated before, the, the older that you present, we might have more severe disease. Um, comorbid conditions, um, the, the list of conditions is extensive, but we have noticed that the risk factors that can put you at having severe disease include diabetes, chronic kidney disease, heart disease, high blood pressure, any sort of um, 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 in disease that you might have that can cause your immune system to be weak or limited, such as cancer and um, HIV. Obesity is another big risk factor that we see a more severe disease in, and also tobacco abuse uh, or tobacco use, because um, that causes actually chronic lung, lung disease. Um, socioeconomic status and gender, we have also noted, noted um, very, uh, very, uh, or we've seen that um, this has been attributed to, to having a, a increased or, so, or advanced disease in certain populations. So we see disproportionate rates of severe disease among blacks, Hispanics, South Asian individuals, and, and men. We see more advanced disease in, in, in men than we do in women. Um, laboratory study, studies or biomarkers um, that have been noted to be abnormal also contribute to um, severe disease, include um, many different um, um, abnormalities um, in when, when, we when we test and look at the bone marrow. So people can present with um, low white blood cell counts, low platelet counts, and also abnormal liver function tests, um, LDH, and other biomarkers um, such as the CRP, the ESR, IL-6, interleukin-6, and ferritin. You know, persons also presenting with elevated D-dimers and abnormal coagulation studies also um, have, um, unfortunately, worse disease. Um, other markers are, are looked at as well. They have done extensive laboratory um, investigation to see uh, which uh, biomarkers actually predict more severe disease. And then other factors such as viral factors which include certain strains of the COVID-19 of COVID will actually um, give you an, an, uh, a higher viral load. And we have seen that, that individuals who have been exposed and have the same virus actually could, uh, present with having very severe disease. And we've seen that in clusters of outbreaks, even within the territory. So we know that certain um, strains of the coronavirus vaccine will actually cause you to have higher viral load, which will cause you to have a more advanced disease. And genetic factors, we have been doing some studying on the different types of blood types that might be contributing to, to more severe disease, unfortunately. Next slide. So severe complications can uh, manifest in many different um, 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 consequences, and, um, and the body can actually uh, respond um, with, with many different complications if you have severe um, infection with coronavirus. And this is attributed to the, the, the hyperinflammatory response that happens, um, the, and it overwhelms your, your body essentially. The most common severe complication is with respiratory failure, in which you would require mechanical ventilation, high levels of oxygen, in which you would have to engage in proning procedures to have better, a better chance of oxygenating um, the lungs and the rest of the body. Um, cardiovascular complications might uh, also uh, occur, arrhythmias and um, acute um, thrombotic events, um, and shock. Um, the, we have seen cardiovascular complications um, with severe disease. Um, thrombotic events, pulmonary embolisms, and stroke. 
Um, that's, this is usually seen when we have um, abnormal coagulation parameters or, or um, lab findings and elevated D-dimers. Um, and I will we'll explain how we treat that um, in, in the future, in future slides. Neurologic complications can happen. And this um, can result in encephalopathy or confusion, um, movement disorders, and even seizures. Sometimes this can happen, or the, these complications can linger, and we'll talk about the long-term um, consequences. And inflammatory complications, in which you can have a multi-system inflammatory um, sort of condition. We have seen this in, in children, but we have definitely also seen it in, in, um, in adults, and which you can have a cytokine storm during an, an acute infection. And then you can also have um, lingering effects that might help cause you to have a hyperinflammatory response um, after recovery. Um, you, this is manifested with fevers and persistently elevated biomarkers. Secondary infections are extremely common. Um, this is um, when people are uh, unfortunately hospitalized for a long time and um, their immune system is, is weakened because of the COVID infection. So then they are susceptible to a um, secondary bacterial or even invasive fungal infections. So um, we have to watch for these complications and manage them in the acute inpatient setting um, in the event that additional antibiotics or antifungals are needed. Next slide. This slide um, was taken uh, as, a, as splices of uh, CAT scan image of the lungs to show the typical findings that, uh, or abnormalities that you can see when somebody presents with COVID um, pneumonia. And as you can see, the arrows will show areas of what we, what we classify as ground glass opacities. And then you can also see some septal thickening around it, surrounding um, the areas of the, of the opacifications. And this has been sort of classic um, for um, COVID-19. As you can see, they can, they, usually are see, they can be seen scattered throughout the lungs, but commonly seen on the periphery. And um, you, sometimes you can see these abnormal findings in, in people who don't have any symptoms at all, some people who are presenting with shortness of breath and pneumonia, and then it can be much worse when you progress to um, acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. Next slide. These are pictures that are taken to show um, other um, complications that we see um, sort of as pearls with, um, with, um, with um, acute infections. Uh, because of the thrombotic events and the vascular changes uh, the, or the vascular damage that can happen, you can have necrotic lesions that happen in various areas around the body. So we have been seeing, um, this, is, this is a picture of, um, of the gluteal area, but you definitely can see necrotic areas and necrotic lesions on various different um, parts of the body. And we have seen this in, in very severe disease. Next slide. So this slide shows um, uh, a depiction of what we call COVID toes. And it's very interesting because um, I've seen this actually locally in individuals who have actually presented with, very, with um, you know, mild to moderate symptoms or mild symptoms. And it can actually happen on the, the hands as well as the toes in which you have changes in the, in the, um, around the nail beds, but uh, definitely in the digits that will show um, um, color discolorations and also um, palpable little nodules. And, um, and it's, sometimes it's painful and sometimes it's not, but it's very distressing to the individual because um, they want to know, you know, why are my feet and why are my, my hands changing? So this is something that, um, that has been um, sort of almost pathognomonic um, and they are calling, classifying it as COVID toes. But you can also see it in the hands as well. Next slide. So the multi-system inflammatory syndrome was first noted in children. And this is something that was identified um, first initially in, out of, um, out of um, the, the surges of cases that happened in New York, in which um, we were identifying a cluster of, um, of children that were presented with, that w with um, symptoms that were very similar to um, a vasculitis, a severe vasculitis, or what was determined as Kawasaki's-like disease. And what we are seeing now is that 
um, in the acute setting, sometimes children who are acutely infected with COVID can have a mild presentation of a hyperinflammatory response in which they can have um, vasculitis-like changes, but it can also be very severe and um, and presenting almost like a, a, like adults in the um, who have severe um, COVID disease and might require additional um, treatment with oxygen as well as uh, medicines to treat the, the inflammatory response. And um, so you can see it acutely, but you can also see it after recovery. And we were really notice, notice, noticing it in children who had negative COVID tests, PCR tests, but positive COVID antibodies that, that indicated a recent um, recovery or, or a recent infection. So um, this is something that um, can be classified um, as ac actually um, mild disease or Kawasaki's like disease or severe um, multi-system inflammatory syndrome. And these children are, are treated as if they are having a, a vasculitis. Uh, but again, we have noticed this um, hyper-inflammatory uh, response upon recovery in adults as well. And um, when it indeed happens in, in adults during um, the, uh, an acute hospitalization, it can sometimes be uh, what we consider and call a cytokine storm. Um, and, um, and we have um, identified medications and management strategies for all of the, the inflammatory syndromes associated with COVID. Next slide. So um, how long did it take you to um, recover from having a, a COVID infection? So recovery varies, and it's going to vary depending on uh, the severity of your illness and as well as um, other risk factors that was previously listed, including comorbid conditions. So you're going to see that um, the two weeks is sort of like the, the lower end of the spectrum because that is typically when we see mild people, people presenting with mild symptoms, they will recover um, completely fully in usually, um, you know, two weeks. Um, however, um, people that have severe disease or moderate to severe disease might take as long as three months to actually recover. The, the, the thing to, to note, and Dr. Ellis may have m mentioned this earlier, is that people can test persistently positive uh, with a PCR test even up to 12 weeks after recovery, and this is not indicative of a reinfection or uh, a, a persistent infection. The people are not contagious. This is just... Um, um, pieces of the virus that continues to be shed, but it is not clinically significant. It's considered viral shedding or viral littering. Next slide. So unfortunately, we are seeing now that sometimes, that, that almost similar to perhaps maybe like um, chikungunya or even Lyme's disease in which we have seen um, conditions or syndromes that will linger for several months or even, you know, some, a long time after recovery. Sometimes we're seeing, we're having reports now as we have been studying this, this um, disease just for about a year now, that people are presenting with fatigue, um, shortness of breath, chest pain, cough, loss of smell, just sort of like, f like chronic inflammatory syndromes, aches, and even um, cognitive deficits or um, difficulties with thinking, dizziness, um, uh, di difficulties concentrating. Uh, it's the, the patients almost pre, uh, re, um, describe it as like a fogginess. And sometimes it, we're seeing that the, these symptoms might linger for a few weeks, but even up to several months after, um, some patients are still being reported. And this is, this is still being investigated to determine, is there going to be some sort of definition of, of like a post-COVID syndrome that will linger. It, it, what we do know about this is that it's not due to persistently um, active infection. Um, however, it might be just um, consistent with like a post-viral syndrome that is common with many other viruses that we've seen in the past. So we're still looking at this, but unfortunately, we, um, the data has to be studied to determine um, why this happens and, um, and essentially um, if there's any risk factors associated with having chronic persistent symptoms. Next slide. Well, I want to define what an emergency use authorization is as we go into the next slides that talks about the treatment because we are currently in the, in the treatment phases um, utilizing the emergency use authorization. 
uh, for, for several treatment modalities or medical countermeasures. So the, an emergency use authorization is an issuance that, um, that comes out from the FDA, but it's not um, a complete FDA approval. It indicates that there is some sort of evidence, right, that a product is actually effective in preventing, diagnosing, or treating a life-threatening disease. And that is where we are. COVID-19 is a life-threatening disease, and we have evidence that um, certain uh, medicines or treatment modalities can be life-saving. So the FDA will then uh, will off will offer an emergency use authorization so that it continues to be studied, and then an approval happens once all of the data comes in um, to say um, if there is if there is approval or if there is indeed um, more more information that needs to be uh, obtained. Next slide. So the treatment of COVID-19 will vary from the, spec the disease spectrum. Um, and all of what I am going to reference comes from the National Institutes of Health uh, that, that has studied all of the clinical trials, all of the data, all of the evidence-based research that has already been done, um, and they have formulated the COVID-19 treatment guidelines. And um, on the left slide, um, the left-hand side of the of the um, of of this slide, um, you can see what is actually being recommended and used for outpatient or. at 7 p.m. and that's a, a challenge right now. We're trying to see how we can work with compressing the, the, this current presentation to get our psychosocial presentation in. Thank you. live but if you submit your questions uh, we will poll them and then we will uh, get responses and make sure those get out thank you so much Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, okay. So, so this, this slide, slide talks about, about the inpatient, inpatient and outpatient, outpatient treatment for COVID-19. Um, and the and outpatient, outpatient um, treatment includes vitamins, monoclonal antibodies, and blood products. 
and we will discuss the mechanism of action on the next slide. Um, inpatient to moderate and, and moderate to severe disease um, is treated differently and um, if um, people are um, presenting to for hospitalization um, they will be supported with oxygen uh, whether it's by high flow oxygen or mechanical ventilation and then also uh, with proning procedures which is um, allows the body to oxygenate um, better um, just by actually putting someone on their belly um, steroids are also recommended um, dexamethasone has been um, the the proven um, the most the most effective um, um, steroid for inpatient management methylprednisolone was also noted early on in the studies and can be used as a substitute the antiviral that has been actually approved by the FDA for use it actually um, received an emergency use authorization early on during the pandemic and after it has been studied it was recommended for use of, of, of moderate disease um, for um, to actually prevent progression to severe disease and the name of this antiviral is remdesivir and um, there are several different immunomodulators that are also recommended for um, that are being studied um, and there's actually one that has been approved um, with the for an emergency youth authorization and it's being studied um, it's and it's being studied to be uh, used in combination with remdesivir and that is actually um, called baricitinib so uh, you have to, uh, I, I have a hard time uh, pronouncing uh, pronouncing um, some of these um, antibodies um, but um, uh, we do not have this combination in the territory, um, but it is being currently studied for, um, for, for use in, in clinical trials. The other um, immunomodulators that, uh, are, that, have been, um, that are being studied include tocilizumab, cerilimab, and um, hmm, siltuximab. And um, I'll, I'll describe the mechanism of action on the next slide. Next slide. So as I stated, the monoclonal antibodies, um, these are molecular engineered antibodies that are targeted specifically against the virus. And these are indicated to be used um, only in mild disease uh, for the prevention of progressing to severe disease. They have actually been studied and shown not effective once you have progressed to, a, to, additional, to an additional phase. We actually have in the territory uh, monoclonal antibodies um, to be used and are used in the uh, emergency room settings if after triage patients are found not to be um, hypoxic and need to be um, hospitalized and we will also be trying to utilize it more widely in the outpatient setting. The antiviral or the remdesivir is um, the mechanism of action is exactly what it states. It's an antiviral. It interferes with the RNA dependent RNA polymerase and it decreases the viral replication or the production of, um, of the COVID, uh, of the SARS-CoV virus. Convalescent plasma works by actually um, pr producing neutralizing antibodies from people who have been, uh, who have recovered from COVID in the past. And this is like a blood product that is transfused and it does, it, we are currently um, using convalescent plasma under an emergency use authorization. The immunomodulators are, they are wide and have, an, and we have a, a, a wide um, a, a amount of, of um, anti-inflammatory agents um, to use and that is currently being studied. The corticosteroids that we know is effective um, and that it is recommended uh, for use of um, moderate to severe disease and that is what we use Decadron uh, for up to 10 days to, uh, for, uh, for disease treatment. Um, interferons have actually uh, been studied and interferon, the use of interferons have actually studied and been shown not effective and is not currently recommended for use of any of the treatment. Currently, we have um, other, other um, immunomodulators that are being studied, interleukin-1 inhibitors. Unfortunately, we have insufficient evidence so far and um, um, there has been limited extra um, use with, um, with IL-1 inhibitors or an anakinra. The IL-6 inhibitors have been a little bit more um, promising, but are currently not being recommended for use 
um, widely, but only in clinical trials, and that is the, the serolivumab, the tocilizumab, and the sultuximab. We also have uh, additional immunomodulators that are being studied only in clinical trials, and those are the kinase inhibitors, and they have many different mechanisms of actions. But essentially, all of the immunomodulators work on, on the cellular level, at the cytokine level, to, in, to limit or stop the hyperinflammatory syndrome that provides um, the cytotoxic um, and, um, and vasculitic effects that cause harm and disease progression and essentially almost even, um, you know, mortality. Next slide. So the NIH treatment guidelines also has uh, priority of, um, and, 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 dis and recommendations for how to treat. Um, for mild disease, um, there are, they, you know, they recommend, uh, there is strategy and recommendation, as I stated, for monoclonal antibodies and convalescent plasma. And then there is strong recommendations to use um, dexamethasone in, in people who are requiring, who are hospitalized and requiring um, oxygen. And then, um, and then also for those who are hospitalized with moderate disease, uh, they recommend to, to start remdesivir um, early to prevent disease progression. And you can either use a, a five to 10 day course, and that's just based on, on clinical, um, clinical judgment in, in, the, in the inpatient setting. And, um, and um, it also does talk about the, the use of other uh, modalities such as um, ECMO or extracorporeal membrane uh, oxygen exchange um, that has actually been proven um, not to be effective and um, people are, we, um, cr critical care physicians are not um, finding um, increased survival with the use of ECMO and um, so um, the, as we continue to, continue to study the treatment guidelines, um, the NIH will continue to update and, and guide us on how uh, we should treat um, inpatient and outpatient um, COVID infections. Next slide. What we know and what we have studied, we know that there are certain um, treatments that have been um, thought to be uh, useful anecdotally, uh, but after many different studies have been done, um, the evidence has been clear to show that what is not recommended for use is hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin, the combination of other anti-HIV um, protease inhibitors, and additionally, ivermectin. Um, the ivermectin has been the most current anecdotally reported um, um, antiparasitic medicine, um, but there, there has not been any evidence that this has been beneficial. And if, if, study, if studies are being done, um, it, much more studies need to be done to, to show that th this is efficacious. But currently, the NIH has put out strong recommendations that none of these combinations have been effective and they should, be, and they should not be, be provided as they might even provide harm. Next slide. Um, this is a slide that shows um, how, um, how patients can be anticoagulated with COVID-19. The previous slides, and previously I, I showed that um, severe disease can, can result in um, thrombotic events, um, and people, people with um, severe disease have, uh, will have elevated D-dimers. So it's a busy slide, and it just shows you, it cascades, and it shows you that, um, that um, or how to, to really start anticoagulation. And the bottom line is that if you are actually hospitalized um, with, um, with biomarkers that show evidence of high, of, of high um, likelihood of having a thrombotic event, um, that anti, full anticoagulation is actually indicated um, as in concurrent treatment with all of the other medical countermeasures. So this is something that is done in, um, um, very frequently and commonly if somebody is hospitalized with COVID-19 to prevent any sort of um, thrombotic events from happening, whether it's a stroke, uh, whether it's a pulmonary embolism or other clots or other necrotic um, um, events that can happen as you saw in the previous pictures. Next slide. So that is all uh, what we talk about if you actually have uh, or get um, severe disease or infected with um, COVID-19. And uh, our most 
strongest um, medical countermeasure has now finally um, come, you know, to the ter to the territory um, along with the the entire nation and the rest of the world. And um, it's very important that we talk about um, trying to prevent um, severe, actually having severe disease and prevent death with COVID-19 by getting the COVID-19 vaccine. So we, I would like to talk about vaccine as a prevention from, from having severe illness from COVID-19. Next slide. Under the emergency use authorization, uh, we've had uh, the, the approval of two vaccines uh, so far in the United States. And um, we've had, we, we are in receipt at, of federal allocations of both the Pfizer-BioNTech and the Moderna um, COVID-19 vaccines. They were both um, granted approval in December of 2020 and, um, and were, we, we, were, we were quickly, we quickly activated our mass vaccination plan to, to start to distribute and vaccinate and immunize um, people in our territory. Um, these two um, companies manufactured uh, the, uh, the COVID-19 by using an mRNA vaccine, which is a messenger RNA vaccine. And the messenger RNA vaccine is essentially just the, the type and it describes what is the antigen presenting molecule in which the vaccine triggers the body to produce the stimulating antibodies so that you're armed, uh, your body is armed against any um, exposure or infection with coronavirus vaccine. The two differ by how it is stored, and the, the Pfizer-BioNTech is stored um, at much colder um, temperatures, um, minus, minus 60, minus 80 degrees, until it needs to be used. And then Moderna, the Moderna vaccine, has just a cold chain storage in which it's just minus 2 to minus 8 degrees Celsius in which it can be stored. Um, both are very equal in efficacy, very high no, um, numbers in efficacy, 90, 94 and 95% um, efficacious, which is great. Um, and, um, but they, they differ with um, the booster. So one, one, the, the Pfizer uh, booster shot, which you have to get after your primer, is um, 21 days after your first shot. And the Moderna, you get boosted 28 days after. Um, the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, was studied and approved for anyone 16 years and older, and the Moderna was approved for 18 years and older. And the only medical contraindication to either of the vaccines is that if you've had a previous severe, life-threatening, allergic reaction to vaccines or vaccines components in the past. So it essentially is very um, safe for all individuals. We are not recommending it in children as yet. Um, but we are also opening up to several different populations who were not even um, um, studied, um, which they're, they're, the data is not, is not available, but only because, um, in theory, all of the um, colleges and medical community have come together to determine that um, there's essentially no harm in several of the other different um, populations that were not studied and that, um, that there is no contraindication um, to, to provide it to, to individuals who were excluded in the studies. And studies are being done now to ensure that um, there indeed is no, is no additional harm for vaccines in you know, the wide general population. But children are still uh, not, not recommended for vaccinations yet. Next slide. So how do we end the pandemic? Um, the, the vaccine is not the, the end all of being all. Um, this slide just shows you that it is uh, a collective effort and that mitigation must happen along with vaccination so that we can continue to flatten the curve and ensure that if we approach it together with the vaccination, then we will be able to stop the infections. Remember, the vaccination doesn't mean that you um, will not become infected. It only means that if you do get infected, that you more than likely will not have any symptoms and you definitely won't progress to having severe disease or dying. So we need to continue to mask, we need to continue to socially distance, clean the environment, wash your hands, and get the vaccine so that once we indeed get the disease burdened down, then we will be able to um, you know, have a path to normalcy. And so this is my last slide, and I think that it echoes exactly what Dr. Ellis ended with by saying, you know, we all have a role to play, and, um, and I hope that we all, um, you know, see the, end, the, the light at the end of the tunnel and get your vaccine as soon as you are um, available or it's available to you. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Hunt Caesar. Uh, based on the time, I'm going to immediately ask Dr. Hamilton to proceed, and uh, it is unlikely we will get to questions, but again, if you put those uh, in the chat or send them, we will respond to them. After Dr. Ellis, we, um, Dr. Hamilton, uh, we will just have uh, Vice President Neese nice come up for the closing. Okay, thank you, thank you. Slide. Okay, so our psychology or our mental health operates oftentimes in the background. It's not usually the thing that we take direct action on. And this is something that we're seeing when we are faced with such a threat to our physical being, we often put our psychology in the background again, uh, even though that's the position from which we do all of our other activities. It's the position from which we work. It's the position from which we take care of other people. It's the position if we're a healthcare worker from which we uh, take care of our patients and so forth. And so our psychology is very, very important. It is basically the, the quality of life that, that we have and it is what's kind of left standing when everything else um, isn't there. If we lose our job or if we have other issues in our lives, our psychology is the thing that we, we have to rely on. So let's look at how our psychology and our mental health is impacted with COVID-19. Go to the next slide, please. These are some of the most frequently noted reactions to the pandemic. And if you look at them, you may find that you had some of these. Some of these are pervasive anxiety, people feeling frustrated and bored because of the lockdowns or restrictions and activities. Um, we often find that there are fears that come up that are not specified fears, they're just general feelings of being afraid. And then there are the protective factors, the resilience and social support that comes into play that can help ward us or protect us against some of these factors that would uh, be deleterious to our mental health or our sense of well-being. Next, please. I'm just gonna look at some studies of mental health symptoms and COVID and what some people, some researchers have found as they have looked at the impact of COVID on us in many ways. So in this study, they found that 53% of adults in the US reported that their mental health was negatively impacted due to actual worry about the virus. And this includes very common symptoms such as difficulty sleeping, disturbance in appetite, and increase in alcohol consumption or substance use. Some people who had existing conditions, be they mental health conditions or be they physical health conditions, reported problematic or worsening of these conditions due to the chronic stress and worry over the coronavirus. We saw that there was a greater than one third increase in symptoms of anxiety or depressive disorder during these weeks that are noted on the slide for May and June and July. You saw significant increases in depressive symptoms as well as anxiety symptoms. And this is, sorry, this is greater than one in three people reporting that. And this is up from um, a reporting of one in 10 reporting these symptoms in January to June 2019. Next. So again, there were increased reporting of mental health issues, um, concerns, substance use, as well as suicidal ideation during the time of COVID, especially during the spring toward the summer. And increases in these symptoms seem to suggest increases in depressive disorders as well as anxiety disorders. And again, suicidal ideation was elevated where about twice as many respondents reported serious consideration of suicide in the previous 30 days than this specific study. So that is a significant uh, finding with respect to impact on mental health and well-being. Next. This data in, is sort of interspersed throughout this presentation and it's looking at the rate of EMS activations, meaning people calling 911 to request help for, for reasons, in this case behavioral reasons, and the as you see with the red line, this is 2020, and the blue line um, is 2018-19, and the green line, sorry, it's hard to see from, from this far, um, 
a couple years before. So as you see with the red line, which is 2020, going into the year, into the new year, you're seeing that spike, which really is around the time of March. And you're seeing that there was a lot of behavioral activations that are much higher than in previous years, people calling 911 um, during this time of COVID, where we had those really the emergency um, being declared and people becoming very, very anxious about the, the disease. Next. One of the behaviors that tends to come up when you're having major stress is the increase in alcohol use or drug use. And that is something that was seen or that has been seen as well, that there is, has been an increase in alcohol use. Um, some of the reported increases are for women, 17% increase over the 2009 baseline. We're seeing a 14% increase overall, and then an increase of 19% in adults age 30 to 59. You can look at some of the other details on the, the slide. I don't want to spend too long on this, but the idea is that there has been an increase in alcohol consumption related, that appears to be related to COVID-19 and the stress related to that. Next. So this is another slide that just shows us what's happening over time, over this period of time with um, COVID and the use of alcohol. Of course, with the stay at home and, and different measures that are encouraging us to spend more time at home and less time in, in restaurants and so forth, there has been less buying of alcohol in those types of establishments. But as you see, online sales of alcohol has really, really taken off during this time. So people are really using alcohol, it seems, as a way of coping or dealing with um, the stress and anxiety over this, this virus. Next. This, again, is an EMS uh, activation slide, and it's looking at how many calls they're getting related to alcohol-related illnesses, maybe someone um, overdosing on, on alcohol. And, and in this case, it actually went lower, which is really difficult to explain because you're seeing the use of alcohol increasing. I would probably understand it more as people are, um, it's possible that as they go over time, we'll see more and more issues related to substance use disorders because people may become dependent if this is a coping strategy that they continue to rely on. But in this case, they didn't result in EMS activations. Next. But we are seeing increases in opioid-related activations. So that is just some more information. And I guess that's consistent with the opioid issues that have been occurring. And uh, with adding that with COVID, you're seeing that there are more people are turning more to opioids. Next. So the issue of suicide is a big issue for, for mental health and for the communities. And in fact, the general findings are that there's really not been a noticeable or a significant increase in, in suicidal behavior. There is the report of increased suicidal ideation where people are reporting thinking about it more. But in terms of the actual behavior, when you look at the numbers of suicide counts, those are pretty equivocal. There are some countries and some states where you saw some increases and some that really didn't show any increase. And so right now, the finding on suicides are equivocal and don't seem to be happening at this point. Could you, next slide. Okay, so we'd wanna interpret any increases with caution. These may be related to specific populations and the specific either cultural factors or protective factors that are happening in those populations. One of the concerns though, this uh, slide, the top of this slide here, they're looking at suicide mortality trends in, in African Americans. And this, there was a sharp increase at some point um, among black residents, and this was in Maryland, this is between March 20th and May 7th, that there was an increase in black resident suicide. And during that time, though, there was a decrease among white residents, and it's not clear, clear what that's related to and whether there are, what the other demographic factors are or social factors are that played a role at that time in this happening for these specific people. However, it's important to identify whatever the vulnerabilities are that made them particularly vulnerable to suicide. Next. 
So this is a good depiction of what the literature is saying regarding suicide. The red line is uh, the past year. Um, the last months of 2019 into 2020. And you're seeing that while suicide rates are rising, they're rising as they have been rising, but they're not rising sharply necessarily in response to COVID or the, at least the first 18, 20 months of the year in 2020. Next. Some special groups. Let's look at how this is affecting some special groups. Next. Health personnel in COVID, uh, much of the research is focused on health personnel and what, ha what their psychological response is to, to COVID because they work so closely with people who are in so much distress and are really on the front lines for that. And they, this particular study found that there was an increase in alcohol use among people with, in healthcare professions um, that increased higher than other people in other professions. And, so increase in mental health support was also higher, which is good among healthcare professionals. However, they still tended to report that they felt more isolated, which also makes sense just in terms of feeling anxious about infecting others and, and so forth, and maybe even needing that space when, when they come home. Next. The issue with healthcare professionals is one that we actually have some data on that it's a bit more longitudinal that we have some data over time on with the SARS and MERS uh, outbreaks they were able to really evaluate what was happening um, with healthcare workers over time whereas for us in the United States this is really the first time we've been this impacted by uh, an illness like this and so we're still trying to understand how it affects us here but what some of the research has found is that even up to three years past those major outbreaks, healthcare professionals still reported significant mental health concerns. Next. So this gives us some information about adolescents who have mental health concerns and their perception was that COVID really has affected their mental health. 51% uh, in March said that it made their mental health a bit worse. In June, 40 40% had said they made it a bit worse. Um, next. And then when they were tested again in going back to school, these adolescents who had mental health concerns felt that their mental health was poor, 58% before returning to school. And then after returning to school, they actually, I think it went up to 69% said that it was, was worse, yeah, since having returned to school. So the impact of returning to school had some uh, had an effect on these children who had mental health concerns. They were between 13 and 25. Um, in terms of some protective factors, seeing their classmates, 58% said that seeing their classmates had a positive effect, 30% said it had a negative effect, and 12 said that it had absolutely no effect. So these adolescents who were returning to school weren't really um, feeling that going back to school was very supportive. Part of the issue was that there weren't any health services, mental health services in school that they felt were supportive. Next. So university students, I found this to be a very interesting article and they were looking at depression, anxiety and stress in university students with the, the pandemic and they found rates of depression at 21%, anxiety at 27 and stress at 32%. And uh, typically depression is around 7% in the population in the United States and so we see that these are definitely elevated numbers but the factors that increase depression for these university students were being female which gender is definitely related to the report of mental health concerns but also staying at home tended to increase depression history of medical illness was related as well as poor and moderate social support tended to be related to increases in depression for anxiety you see that there are other factors that were related to anxiety and for the experience of stress you see that other factors were related to the experience of stress for university students so um, this type of information is very useful in terms of targeting um, interventions to these specific groups of, of our populations. Next. 
So some other considerations. Next, please. Gender. Again, gender, women tend to report more negative mental health impacts um, than men do in general. We tend to report these symptoms. We tend to seek help and so forth, and that has been consistent. Employment, there are, if someone is an unemployed or underemployed or has lost their job, that tends to be someone who is more likely to report negative um, impact of coronavirus or worry, anxiety, depression, and so forth. And it's also related with the in increased use of substances. Income is related. We, I, I really appreciated this quote. It says, our analysis suggests that the emotional costs of the pandemic are much higher for the poor and the vulnerable than they are for the rich, heightening deep pre-existing inequalities and in well-being in the U.S. and in other countries. And so the, this variation in terms of how the, it, the virus or the pandemic impacts people, again, has a lot to do with what their, their basic demographic factors are. Next. The impact of lockdown. Um, so social isolation is definitely a risk factor for many mental illnesses and concerns. And when we are kind of forced into quarantine or forced into lockdown or needing to have social distance or physical distance rather for our physical health, it tends to have impacts on our mental health. And in terms of this study, there was findings that lockdown and the longer the lockdown went tended to result in poorer mental health. This was done in India though, so there are some cultural factors that may be playing a role as well. And for the group that was more impacted were people aged 12 to 21 years old. They had the higher psychological impact and it may be because their social routines were more affected or their expectations for social routines were more affected. Next. So again, the impact of quarantine here or lockdown at baselines, depression in this case were 3.1 to 3.6. And at two weeks of lockdown, depression was at 23.4%. And at three weeks of lockdown, it was at 37.8%. So we're seeing that the impact of lockdown is significant in terms of people's sense of mental health and well-being during the, these times. Uh, for si social isolation, people who were sheltering in place um, reported more negative health effects from worry and stress than people who did not shelter in place. Uh, there, it, it could be due to the fact that they were so more feeling more socially isolated. It may also be that people who are more anxious and stressed anyway are going to choose to uh, socially isolate because they're worried more about contracting the, the virus. Next. Okay, so promoting resilience, we can promote resilience at individual levels as well as system, systems levels. So next slide. And the research really does point to the different effects of the virus and the other issues that come along with the virus in terms of social isolation, disruption with routines, financial insecurity, worries about getting ill, and so forth on different groups of people. And the, so we really have to take it from an individual perspective and looking at that person's context if you're working with an individual. Um, so individuals have lots of power over their own lives and their own health, and they can really take some steps to actively seek information regarding their mental health and how to support their mental health. Again, psychology, our psychology, our mental health tends to operate in the background. We tend to ignore it. We tend not to pay attention to it until it's pretty severe, but it is the position from which everything else happens. And so it's so important for us to be proactive in these situations in terms of supporting and protecting our mental health. And there are many interventions that can be done at the systems level as well to support the community at large, our workplaces, and other people who we live and work with. So I thank you guys. And I'm sorry if I really rushed through that. I know we are under some time constraints. And I appreciate your attention. Yeah, I, I want to say, uh, as the moderator, thank you so much to our panelists. Um, we have gone um, significantly over time by at least 30 minutes. Um, but the information was really um, well received, and I am sure that uh, our virtual audience has appreciated uh, the information. So 
We thank you for what you have done for the preparation that you did and the presentation that you, the presentations that you all have made. I'm going to call uh, Vice President Neves now, who will be uh, closing us out. Thank you, everyone. I just want to reiterate uh, what Dr. Michael said. Uh, this has been a great first lecture. Ladies, Dr. Hunt-Caesar, Dr. Ellis, Dr. Hamilton, our moderator, Dr. Michael, did an amazing job. Um, we were doing our promotional tour this morning, and one of the uh, hosts of a radio show said, uh, we have the powerhouse women uh, on our campus. <laughs> this evening, um, and it's very true. Uh, you are leading the, our, our uh, recovery in our hearts physically and mentally. So I just wanted to make sure that our viewing audience is aware of the wonderful women leading the way for the Virgin Islands in our recovery and uh, maintenance throughout the COVID pandemic. The Gallibert family has done so much throughout the years for the university. Uh, our records show that you gave your, uh, your father, Dr. Gallibert, gave his first gift in 1973 to the university. Your mother gave a gift 10 years later, but throughout the years you've given us a whole lot. You've given us funding to create an endowment that allows us to have this lecture series into perpetuity, and we so much appreciate what you do for UVI and our community. So we just want to show you some appreciation uh, at this time. You've given us a lot. We want to give you a small token of appreciation back. President Hall. It's if so we can have some, the family, Gallibert Gallib family, join us. We would like to present this plaque uh, made of local wood that stands as an anchor for this family as they have stood as an anchor for this community. It reads the inaugural Andre and Edith Rose Gallibert Lecture Series, the University of the Virgin Islands, Albert A. Sheen Campus, St. Croix, Virgin Islands, uh, the first inaugural occurred on Thursday, January the 28th, 2021. It is with deep appreciation and respect that we present this as a small token of our appreciation and another anchor for your family. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we, uh, we will conclude the streaming part and take a few photos, but just want to tell the streaming audience, thank you so much for joining us this e evening. Uh, it's been a while for us to get this put together, and we really do appreciate you listening and taking in this wonderful information and uh, learning a lot from our esteemed guests. Thank you so much.